Much. Can everybody hear me? Do we need to turn oh. these? Can we? That's the one you got to see. That, that, that's not amplified, Michael. That, 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 that's for the, the, the recording. Here. Okay. So speak loudly. Speak loudly. Okay, I'll uh, use my training as an instructor to project. Um, I'm very honored to be here at Mr. Jefferson's University. Um, this is going to be my first time here, hopefully, not my last. Thomas Jefferson was absolutely my favorite president, and I suspect the best president that this country has ever had. Um, one of my favorite quotes was uh, from John F. Kennedy, who was hosting a dinner for 49 Nobel Prize winners, and they were all gathered at the White House. And JFK announced that this was the most prestigious group of people that the greatest collection of talent ever to have dined at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. <laughs> I am a libertarian, and most people in the United States have never heard of the Libertarian Party, in spite of the fact that we've been around for 33 years. And what's worse, many people who have heard of us have a lot of misinformation about what the Libertarian Party is. Many people think that because of our name we are liberals. And while it is true that we have some, we are liberal on some positions, we are also conservative on other positions. Libertarians are for liberty. If it helps, we are libertarians. Liberty is kind of an abstract word though. And fortunately, your age group is very, very attuned to the definition of liberty. You have an innate understanding of liberty. How many people here uh, occasionally, at least during the summer, live at home with mom and dad? Still, okay, which is, is expected. How many people anticipate that you will still be living at home in five years? Okay. Again, that is also expected. Every one of you has expectations of moving out, getting your own apartment, and leaving home. Why? Don't mom and dad love you? Is mom a bad cook? Maybe dad doesn't treat you well. Now, if I understand this, you're probably living, mom and dad live in this three or four bedroom home, You've got cable TV, refrigerator full of food, two, maybe even three cars in the driveway. And you are planning to move out 
into a small studio apartment with a little tiny TV, twisted coat hanger for an antenna, miniature fridge. You open it up and you've got ice cubes and leftover bologna, maybe a rusted Volkswagen in the driveway. I mean, it's not that many years since I was in college and I moved out determined to be on my own. Why do we move out? Why do we leave mom and dad? For liberty. So that we can make our own decisions. That's the definition of liberty. So you can make your own life choices. And it's appropriate and it's built in to every one of us. All of us has liberty in our hearts as we grow up. The definition of liberty is making your own choices. In any decision about your life, either you can make that decision or the government can make that decision for you. Can I see a show of hands? How many people prefer making decisions about their own life? Okay, hold them up. And I'd like you to look around. Look around the auditorium. And those are all the people who are libertarian at heart. <laughs> Whether you vote libertarian is yet to be determined. The Libertarian Party platform is based on individual rights and personal responsibility. You can do anything you want in your life, but you have to suffer the consequences of your decisions. Okay? That is, that's the simplest definition of the Libertarian platform. Now, before I go into some of the issues, because I'm sure that we'll get to those in the questions, I'm very concerned about my country. Thomas Jefferson and the other founding fathers established the Constitution to protect our lives, our uh, liberty, and our property. And that is the only valid purpose of the government that we formed in Washington. But the people in Washington have apparently forgotten that. The Bill of Rights is under attack. I spoke to a uh, a university audience who was much smaller than this and we were in an auditorium at least this large. I had about 15, 18 students in the first two rows. Well, we were such a small group that looked rather awkward and I asked somebody, why? Why did we, you know, why did you reserve this huge auditorium when a smaller classroom would have been, you know, more sociable, a little bit easier to talk to? And I was told that because I was a presidential candidate because I was a politician that I had to speak in the auditorium because quote it was a free speech zone <laughs> so my next question was well what does that mean about the area outside of the auditorium and I was assured that it was not a free speech zone I, I guess it was a uh, a speech free zone outside and, and again, we're, we're moderately amused, but that is not the purpose of the Bill of Rights. That's not the purpose of the First Amendment. I don't know how many people watched the Democratic National uh, Convention in Boston, but they showed a free speech zone not far from the convention. And if you are watching that convention, you'll notice that it was chain link fence topped by razor wire. That was the free speech zone. To me, that looked like a prison. That looked like a concentration camp. That was in the United States. Let me give you my interpretation of a free speech zone. Anywhere I happen to be standing is a free speech zone. Your freedoms are not granted to you by the Bill of Rights. We, the people, wrote the Bill of Rights to put further limitations on the government. The First Amendment doesn't grant you freedom of religion. The First Amendment does not say you can attend any church you want. The First Amendment does say that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. 
Most people are aware that the Constitution has a preamble. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, but very few people, I doubt that one in 10,000 people in the United States are aware that the Bill of Rights also has a preamble. And that preamble establishes these as further restrictive and declaratory clauses. These are restrictive clauses. They are putting further restrictions on the government. They are also declaratory clauses. Does a declaration ask for permission? Did we write the Declaration of Independence and say, Dear King George, would it be okay with you if we started our own country? It was a declaration of independence. And the Bill of Rights is a declaration of our rights. We do have freedom of speech. We do have freedom of religion. We are telling the government so. We are not asking them for permission. How many people in the audience have ever filled out a government form that allows you to go to church on Sunday? Not a single one. Nobody in the audience has a church permit because you do not require a permit in order to exercise a right. A church permit is completely ludicrous. So then why, in the United States, if I have a right to keep and bear arms, do I have to fill out a piece of paper to get a concealed carry permit? A gun permit is just as ludicrous as a church permit, and I don't need no stinking permits. Many of you, no doubt, have heard about the Patriot Act. I doubt that any of you have read it. 285 pages. That's all right. Congress didn't read it either. <laughs> the Patriot Act presumably eliminates the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment guarantees your right to privacy. It states explicitly that government must have a warrant supported by oath or affirmation before they're allowed to search your property. Of course, under the Patriot Act, government can come in, search your property, do what they term a sneak and peek search, and then leave, and they don't feel they're required to tell you for at least 90 days. That is not protecting your privacy. Most people think that the Patriot Act doesn't apply to me. Hey, I'm not a terrorist. How many people have flown since September 11th and gone through TSA security? How many people feel that you are being kept safe by TSA security? That, that is not security. That is a passenger inconvenience plan. They're not keeping you safe. And as a candidate for president, I fly most of my flights one way as I go from city to city. Very rarely do I travel round trip. And because they are one-way tickets, I am randomly selected about 80% of the time for additional security. And I have to bite my lip as they go through my computer bag and open up all my luggage to see if there's anything in there with a sharp point. So as I was going through security, I saw a group of about four high school girls traveling together. One of the girls had been selected for additional security, and she is standing there obligatory with her arms out. Security guard is checking her with the magic wand. And her friends are in the next aisle, the next line, going through regular security. And they're taunting her. And they're yelling, strip search, strip search. Well, I was an adolescent once. I understand why that might be mildly amusing, but what if they did? What if 10% of the people who wanted to get on the airplane had to strip down to their underwear? How many of you would be... Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, so there are some things about college I did forget until just now. <laughs> My point is that going through security at the airport is a blatant violation of your liberties. It's a blatant violation of your privacy. And it does not protect your security. My girlfriend is a flight attendant for a major airline. And every once in a while, they bring a sky marshal onto the airplane. Now, nobody knows who the sky marshals are because they're always walking around with a crew cut. They always enter the airplane five minutes before the first class passengers, and they're always carrying the locked luggage. <laughs> they take the sky marshals onto the airplane to introduce them to the flight attendants. The flight attendants have to know who the sky marshals are and where they're sitting so that they don't, you know, initiate a false, a false alarm. Sky Marshall got onto my girlfriend's airplane and announced that he had just come through security. Security allowed him to keep the 357 on his hip, but they took the nail clippers away from him. <laughs> this does not border on insanity. This has long since crossed the line. And that is the government that we are currently trusting to keep us safe in the air. And frankly, I do not feel safe, and it is certainly does not justify the loss of our privacy and our liberties. The Patriot Act also violates the Sixth Amendment, which guarantees you the right to assistance of counsel for your defense, unless, of course, you're a terrorist, because then we can throw you in jail without an indictment for an indefinite amount of time with no phone call, no lawyer, how does that protect your safety? If someone really is a terrorist, show us the evidence, we'll put him in jail. But when the government can label someone and deny them due process of law, they can do the same thing to you. Most of what our government does these days is unconstitutional, and I find that unconscionable and totally unacceptable. Thomas Jefferson would never have approved. That is why I am running for President of the United States. When you read the preamble to the Constitution, it says, we the people ordain and establish the Constitution. We the people created our government in 1789. Therefore, the government works for us. We, the people, have rights. We give the government privileges, and we can take those privileges away anytime we are brave enough to do so. And it's about time that someone went to Washington to remind Congress of the proper balance of power. People frequently ask me, well, aren't you really just stealing votes from my candidate? And the Democrats think that I'm stealing votes from Kerry. The Republicans insist that I'm stealing votes from Bush. We are libertarians. We are strong on private property. We would never steal anybody else's property. <laughs> but the question itself presupposes that Bush and Kerry have some vested interest, some vested right in those votes. They have a predisposition to those votes, and that is not true. Each of you has the right to cast one ballot, and you can and should cast that ballot for the candidate that you think will best represent you in Washington. The only wasted vote is when you cast your ballot for a candidate that you do not respect. When people interview me, they frequently say, well, you can't possibly win, which is not true, by the way. But they say, you cannot possibly win, so who do you prefer? Who are you going to vote for? <laughs> <laughs> what an insult. Do they ask George Bush who he's going to vote for? And my response to that is to let them know that I'm insulted 
to let them know that if I thought that I could vote for George Bush or John Kerry and respect myself in the morning, that I would still be at home in Austin, Texas. I am not willing to let my country go down the drain. I am not willing to let Congress continue ignoring the Constitution and violating my rights. If you or I violate the law, we go to jail. If a member of Congress violates the supreme law of the land, they just get reelected. And sadly, you are the people who are reelecting them. And that is very much like buying the rope for your own hanging. So for those of you who are afraid to waste your vote, let me ask you this hypothetical. Imagine for a moment that you are in prison and you have a 50% chance of lethal injection. You've got a 45% chance of going to the electric chair. And you have a 5% chance of escape. Are you going to vote for lethal injection? Because that's the most likely outcome? <laughs> Is this audience full of electric chair supporters? <laughs> going to vote for the lesser of two evils? Or are you, like me, going to vote for survival, going to vote for escape, even though there's only a 5% chance, knowing that your survival is based on that 5%. It is the best option that you have if you choose to survive. If you vote for the Democrats or the Republicans, you are committing political suicide. The Democrats and Republicans are both going to raise your taxes. The Democrats and Republicans are going to both expand the scope and role of the federal government. The, federal, the Democrats and Republicans are both going to continue this war in Iraq. The Democrats and Republicans are both planning to restore the draft, which this particular age group should be very, very conscious of. The Democrats and Republicans both want to increase your taxes. I am the only candidate that wants to eliminate the IRS and let you keep all of the money that you have worked so hard for. When I was growing up, my, both of my parents, but specifically my mother, were constantly admonishing me to think for myself. Twice a day at least, mom would ask me, if your friends are going to jump off of a cliff, are you going to do something stupid and jump off a cliff just because your friends are doing it? So let me change that. If your friends are going to vote Democrat or Republican, are you going to do something stupid just because your friends are going to do it? At your age, one of the things that you value most, one of the things that you pride yourself on is independence. The ability to think for yourself. The willingness and desire to make your own decisions. And I strongly encourage that. I encourage you to investigate the Democrats and Republicans and then go to the LP.org website find out about the Libertarian Party, go to my website at bednarkark.org, read my position papers, and if you have decided that the Libertarians and Michael Bednark will better represent you in Washington, I strongly urge you to do the right thing, to make your own decision, and to vote Libertarian. Thank you very much. So we'll have some time now for questions, uh, just to lay a few ground rules. We're going to e limit each person to one question so we can get as many people as possible. So no matter how much you want to, please don't follow up. And so if we'll start the questioning. I'll just pick people at random. Uh, go ahead, sir. What does the state militia aspect of the Sacramento mean to you? Thank you so much. Does somebody plant you in the audience for me? <laughs> 
The question was, what does the term militia in the Second Amendment mean to me? Well, the term militia means the same thing to me as it did to the Founding Fathers. We the people are the militia. And if you read the Federalist Papers, you know that the militia consists of anybody older than 16 capable of carrying a rifle. We the people are the militia. And the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. There are many people who suggest that the word militia generates a, a community right of the right to be keep and bear arms, which applies to only the National Guard. Well, first of all, there is no such thing as a community right because communities do not exist. Only individuals exist. Early this morning, as each of you were waking up and you were standing alone in the bathroom staring in the mirror, each of you had individual rights trying to decide what you were going to do for the day. We come here this evening in a small temporary community. Do you have more rights or less rights than you did this morning when you were looking at yourself in the mirror? And the answer is neither. You have exactly the same rights that you did this morning because you are an individual, not because you are a member of this community. And so anybody who tells you that the Second Amendment conveys a community right is either terribly misguided or evil. All of the Bill... Thank you. All of the Bill of Rights refer to individual rights. It's an individual right to freedom of speech, an individual right to freedom of religion, and an individual right to protect your life and the lives of your children. Go ahead, sir. How quickly would you move American troops from Iraq and Afghanistan, and how would you do it? Well, my standard answer to that is that I would bring our sons and daughters home as safely and quickly as possible. The focus being on safely. I do not want to have any more fatalities or any more injuries than we already have, if possible. My mindset would be anywhere between three to six months. I'm not a military expert. That's why I would just give the order to my military advisors and tell them, bring our troops home as safely and quickly as possible. I don't know how long it would take. Obviously, there's a law, there are laws of physics. You know, you have a, a certain number of people, and it's not going to happen overnight. It's probably not going to happen in two weeks. But if it, ha if it takes longer than six months, I, I would want to know why. Mm. Right, sir? The Constitution says that it exists to provide for the common defense. So, uh, how do you propose without such measures to provide for the common defense, especially against terrorists and the airlines? Well, to provide for the common defense, my job is to protect your life, your liberty, and your property. And one of the best ways that I can begin with that is to eliminate 20,000 unconstitutional gun laws so that you can begin to protect your own life. The, the second part of that answer is in response to terrorism. Now, what we are doing is creating more terrorism. 92%... Thank you, I knew I was good, but I didn't... 92% of the people in Iraq don't like us. They consider us occupiers, not liberators. And our strategy for winning friends and influencing people is to bomb more buildings and kill more innocent civilians and then we're surprised when they don't come running out into the streets to hug us. We are creating more terrorism the longer we stay. So I cannot make terrorism go away completely. Libertarians do not promise utopia. But I can reduce the amount of terrorism by not stirring any more up. Uh, you in the white? 
Could you envision this too? I mean, give us a scenario in which you envision the American people collectively taking up arms as a militia to defend American soil? Is it impossible for you to think of that? The question was, do I really imagine ordinary Americans picking up weapons as the militia to defend American soil? Well, let me tell you that I certainly would. If anybody was coming to attack my town, I would certainly be willing to protect it. And let me point out that in the Constitution, let's see if I get my clauses right. I have the wrong numbers. But one clause says that Congress can establish a navy. And there is no time period because a navy exists out in the ocean and is not a threat to the people on land. Another clause says that Congress has the power to establish an army, but no appropriation for that use shall be for a term longer than two years because the Founding Fathers were terrified of a standing army. You give 100,000 men or women guns to go out there and protect your property, all they have to do is an about face, and now they can use those weapons to take your property. So if the army was supposed to be established when there was a war declared, go for two years and then be abandoned, well, then what protection would Americans have when there was no army? And then there are two clauses in the Constitution which explicitly state that Congress has the power to call forth the militia, and the next one is the responsibility of arming and training the militia. So the way I read the Constitution, instead of having 20,000 gun laws that prevent me from having a gun, Congress has the responsibility of arming the militia. So I don't think that it is totally far-fetched. It is not part of our normal, everyday life, but that is precisely what the Founding Fathers intended. Are you still there in the gray? What is the nature of your take on the education, the public education system in the country, and what you would do if elected president with that? I would like to know if you'd be willing to support public universities such as this, public schooling for elementary and high school level students throughout the country, and things like government programs such as grants to students who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford university education. There are actually two questions in there. Let me answer the first one as about public education. Anytime you want to improve the quality of the service and decrease the cost of that service, you need to privatize it. The Department of Health... See, I told you the room was filled with libertarians. When the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare started in 1953, American students were number one in math and science, and we were so far ahead of number two, it wasn't even a horse race. Since then, the government has been in control of education for 50 years. We now spend 10 times as much per student, and American students are coming out of schools 29th in math and science. So even if the Department of Education were constitutional, and it clearly is not, we ought to eliminate the Department of Education because students are getting dumber instead of smarter. The second part to your question was about funding public universities and funding anything. Welfare is theft. You have a right to your property. You do not have a right to someone else's property. If you come into my house and take $100 out of my wallet to pay for your schooling, that's theft. If the government takes $100 out of my wallet and then gives it to you, that's government-assisted theft. And libertarians are opposed to both. There's... I am an instructor, and I have been most of my life. I started teaching when I was five. My dad brought a blackboard home and mounted it in the basement. Mom said that I took my two younger brothers downstairs and immediately started teaching them the alphabet. I've been an advanced first aid instructor, CPR instructor, water safety instructor, trainer, scuba instructor, skydiving instructor. If I've done it, I've taught it. Now, I recognize that money has nothing to do 
with education. If you're struggling with calculus and I hand you a hundred dollar bill, does that help you pass your exam? No. Money is not related to how well people learn. Learning is a factor of how well the instructor can inspire curiosity and stimulate your um, creativity. And that doesn't require money. What we want to do is privatize education, allow teachers to do what they do best, and that's teach, allow parents to send their children to whatever school they want, and the good schools will become profitable, the bad schools will either go out of business or become a good school. Now, this university was started as a private university, and we still, to this day, even with a bad economy, have people who are philanthropic and who create scholarships for those who are not capable uh, of paying for their whole um, tuition. Now, when we privatize education, the cost of education should come down, and just about everybody would be able to afford not only an education, but a quality education. And as long as um, charity is done voluntarily, uh, libertarians are all in favor of it. But we will not allow someone to take someone else's money for their benefit. Uh, you starting to blow? Jeffrey Hijacker in September 11th was in Congress. How do you reform our immigration policy to protect our borders? This is definitely a, a volatile subject, and it has a number of different parts. One of the things that we cannot do is to fall prey to certain prejudices just because someone comes from a particular country. There are good people and bad people from every ethnic culture. And we cannot just label one ethnic culture with a broad brush. The way that we put Japanese Americans in concentration camps in California during World War II, while at the same time the children of those people in concentration camps were fighting valiantly. That, that is an egregious abomination of people's rights, and, and we should be very embarrassed about that period of our history. We should not repeat that. Now, we can and should protect our borders. If we have information about a particular individual, regardless of what ethnic background they are, then we can be looking for that particular individual. With regard to immigration, and much of that is concerns our southern border, we need to stop being hypocritical about the fact that our economy depends on many of those people coming from south of the border. If it were possible to round everybody up and send them back to Mexico, our economy would falter. And many of the products and services you take for granted would not be available because those people are willing to do jobs that at a wage that Americans wouldn't even dream of. So what we need to do is recognize they are important to our economy. We need to lower the paperwork hurdle that will allow them to come to our country legally and to do those jobs that, that we depend on. But then there is yet another factor about our southern border which many people this far north are unaware of. And that is that there are drug dealers coming across the border. There are coyotes that are trafficking in human lives. And there are also, I'm told, uh, subsets of the Mexican military that are crossing our borders, damaging property, and killing individuals in the south. And those crimes must not go unpunished. We need to use the government for what it was designed to do, and that was to protect the lives, the liberty, and the property of our citizens. Uh, you there in the back? Has everybody heard that question? Do I need to repeat that? Um, I've, I've not heard that theory before. 
I mean, it sounds like it could be semi-plausible with one minor problem, and that is that Americans are addicted to oil. I mean, you're more likely to have a crack addict give up, you know, their their drugs than you'll get normal Americans to give up their oil. Now, I admit that that is a, a significant part of our problem, and the reason that we have that problem is because the government has has played too much of a hand in supporting the oil and automotive industry, subsidizing both of them very heavily. Libertarians believe in the free market. And what we would do to solve that would be to remove those subsidies. Now, uh, there is going to be a, an immediate problem. The price of gasoline at the pump is going to go up, and Americans are going to be a little bit irritated with that. However, that is precisely the motivation that people require to ride their bicycles a little bit more, to drive less often, and it is precisely the motivation that private companies would need to develop other sources of energy and to develop other forms of transportation. We've created the problem. It's going to hurt a little bit as we resolve the problem, but we need to get the government out of the economy. Thanks so much for coming to visit us. Um, I actually support every plank for platform except one, um, and that's for training the gold standard. Um, do you believe that it makes more economic sense to, I mean, is, is it that you're ideologically opposed to having the Federal Reserve, um, where you think it makes more economic sense to have a relatively fixed money supply? That is the first time anybody has contradicted my platform on the gold standard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for entertaining me a little bit. Um, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 gives Congress the responsibility to coin money and regulate the value thereof. Notice that it does not say, and emit bills, as it did in the original draft. Why do we have the Constitution at all? What happened to the Articles of Confederation? We, first of all, we did not win the American Revolution. We just refuse to lose. So we, the American Revolution is over, and France and Spain have the audacity to ask for the money back that they had loaned us. The 13 colonies were all printing money like it was going out of style. They were in competition to see who can print it faster. And when you print money out of thin air, you inflate the economy, and the money that you already have in your hand becomes worth less. And so the people were going, wait a minute, time out. Independence is a really great thing. We like that, but the economy is floundering. And they sent the delegates back to Philadelphia to amend the Articles of Confederation, add a paragraph, delete a sentence. They did not. They scrapped the Articles of Confederation. They wrote the Constitution. And the problem was stimulated by the fact that government was printing money. And so when the original draft said to coin money and emit bills, many people said, no, we're not voting for it. We're going to go back to our state and tell our delegates not to ratify it. So Congress has the power to coin money. Article 1, Section 10 explicitly says the states shall not use anything but gold and silver coin as a tender in payment of debt. The reason for that is that gold and silver do not inflate. They have intrinsic value. An ounce of silver today will still be an ounce of silver a hundred years from now. And that is precisely what the uh, Founding Fathers intended. That is precisely what we need in order to have a stable economy. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was totally unconstitutional because Congress does not have the authority to trans that, transfer that power to an outside entity. I think you make a very good point about uh, the effectiveness of TSA. However, uh, since September 11th, there seems to be a need for some sort of security. So what type of alternative to TSA would you support as being more effective, particularly since many of the September 11th hijackers were first-time offenders? So you can't separate people out as um, based on prior offenses. And since you can talk about um, being reticent to paint a very broad brush, um, that seems to me that you'd also be opposed to ethnic profiling. So, what would you support? Well, 
I cannot promise you that you can live in a risk-free society. And, and that's, that's not what libertarians are offering. There are people out there who don't like us. One of the reasons they don't like us is because we've got our military in 135 countries around the world. We are influencing other governments, influencing other economies, and politically poking other countries in the eye with a sharp stick. Libertarians would like to follow George Washington's advice that he gave us during his farewell address when he said that we should uh, maintain economic ties with all countries and entangling alliances with none. That means that we should open up our free markets to other countries that will improve our economy, in, uh, increase the standard of living of other countries, and dramatically reduce the chances that they are going to bite the hand that feeds us. Now, thank you. Now, with regard to your safety, you own your body. You're responsible for putting food in your mouth. You're responsible for putting a shelter over your head. And ultimately, you are responsible for protecting yourself, which is what the Second Amendment guarantees you the right to do. If you have a right to keep and bear arms on the ground, I see no reason why that should suddenly, you know, disappear when you get into the air. And I would eliminate the FAA and let each airline decide what security measures they were going to introduce. And if there was an airline that allowed me to carry my 45 on the airline, that is the only airline I would fly. And I know that on that airline, any hijacker is never going to get past the beverage cart. <laughs> For that. Um, you, earlier you said stuff about eliminating the IRS. There's some good proposals out there for a national consumption tax in lieu of the income tax. Is that a proposal you're behind because the libertarians are uh, no, it's not necessarily a proposal that I'm behind. It doesn't make sense to me to take arsenic away from you and give you strychnine. I mean, the economy depends on you being able to keep your money and invest it in things that you want to invest it in. What people don't understand is that the IRS only comprises a small percentage of the national income. The government gets money on excise taxes, corporate taxes, um, gasoline taxes, the government gets a lot of money. So if I were to eliminate the IRS overnight, the government would still have plenty of money. It would not be broke by a long stretch. But the Democrats and Republicans who are in Congress currently have a, they always, they, they spend approximately $700 billion over budget. Why bother writing in a budget? Why put it down on paper if you're going to miss it by over half a trillion dollars? I mean, a budget is a budget. And one of the things that those of you who have already moved out have learned is that when you move into your own apartment, there's one valid rule. You cannot spend more than you bring in. And if you can learn that, I'm sure that I can teach that lesson to Congress. <laughs> I presume that you're against antitrust laws. Would you have corporations able to operate unfettered and create monopolies? The question was, would I allow corporations to uh, operate unfettered? The answer is yes. To create a monopoly is a misunderstanding of the economy. Large corporations can only create a monopoly with government assistance. For example, the railroads who were given vast tracts of land and didn't have to pay for it. Um, Enron was you know, able to do a lot of their things because they were greasing the skids. These large corporations give millions and millions of dollars to both the Democrats and the Republicans. So what kind of ideology are they following? They don't have a particular preference. They are just trying to make sure that they've spent enough graft so that whoever does get into Congress is going to vote to give their corporation or their industry special interests. And libertarians are against individual welfare. We are against corporate welfare. And we... Thank you. And if you understand the free market, the battle of ideas, the competition, and the idea that the consumer decides 
what companies and what services are going to stay in existence because you, the consumer, spend your money at, for the goods and services that you think are the best and for the cheapest price. And you cannot create a monopoly without government assistance. Um, if you were president during the September 11th attacks of 2001, um, I just wanted to ask you what would be your response to that? My response to September 11th would be to respond appropriately to an international mass murder, which is what it was. It was not war. We, we didn't declare war. And, and yes, it was a terrible tragedy. About 3,000 people died. And we would approach that the same way that we would any other crime. We would get CSI New York out there, discover whatever evidence we can, identify the people who had perpetrated it, which at this time, based on the knowledge that I'd been given over the television, that was Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And I would have relentlessly and dogmatically pursued them until we could bring them back to justice. It makes no sense at all to say, well, they're going to be a little bit difficult to find, so we're going to send 150,000 troops over here to Iraq, which, again, based on the knowledge that I have right now, had nothing to do with September 11th. That was un-American and unconstitutional. understood the first part of that, and, I, and I, we agree that you have natural rights that do not come from the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. What was the second part of the libertarian what? I guess I'm just wondering, like, you know. Are you worrying about charity and, and the people who... It's not charity. I mean, I'm, I'm putting it in that one. I'm just wondering, you know, Americans aren't alone in the world. I'm wondering, like, how libertarian principle translate uh, like a humanitarian impulse. A humanitarian impulse? Yeah, are Americans are the most generous culture on the face of the earth, bar none, which is one of the reasons that I'm so proud to be an American. Within one month of September 11th, Americans contributed five billion dollars to the city of New York. Not because there was an IRS agent knocking at the door, telling you what your fair share was, not because there was a police officer shaking you down for cash, but because we empathized with the tragedy. That was our tragedy. And we all came together and gave of our hearts and our wallets to help the people who needed it. People quit their jobs and traveled across the country to go to New York to do what they could do. And that's what Americans do. And when we get rid of the IRS, and it get the, leave the money in your pocket so that you can stimulate the economy, the economy will not only grow, it will grow exponentially, and we will have far more money so that we can be far more char charitable. Thank you. Uh, yeah, previous uh, presidential candidates have advocated um, presidential, using presidential pardon to um, pardon nonviolent criminals. I'm a libertarian. <laughs> yes, there's no such thing as a victimless crime. I mean, it's an oxymoron. And it is sad. As proud as I am that Americans are generous, I am embarrassed that we have more people in prison in the United States than they do in communist China. And most of the people that we have in prison are in prison due to nonviolent drug offenses. Now, you know, when I never smoked a marijuana cigarette. I had friends in college who did, and they basically just wanted to sit around and order pizzas. <laughs> now, I have recommended several times that Domino's and other food uh, pizza chains file a class action suit against the government because if marijuana were legal, they would have sold millions of dollars worth of pizza. <laughs> Um, if you could go to speak with us, um, I'd like to ask you, as a libertarian, 
like obviously most of Congress is either Republican or Democrat, or these stragglers on the independent side, but as a libertarian, how would you work with Congress? How would you convince them to do what we need to do, have checks and balances, and you seem to feel like you can lead them, but I, I'm doubtful that they would listen to one person. Oh, I'm very persuasive. <laughs> um, you, thank you for inviting me here to uh, to the university again. I'm I'm very honored, and thank everybody for coming out and taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, come and listen to uh, a politician talk about the Constitution. The question was, how would I, a libertarian president, work with? a Democratic and Republican Congress. That presumes that I would work with them. I would take an oath of office to protect and defend your rights, and that would include defending them from Congress. You've learned that we have three branches of government and that the Founding Fathers established a system of checks and balances. Currently, Congress will pass an unconstitutional act, the President will sign it into law, and the Supreme Court will misinterpret it. <laughs> Where in that system are your rights being protected? Simply by not electing me as a libertarian president, I promise, I don't make many promises, but I promise to veto every unconstitutional law that Congress sends to my desk. Now, Congress can override my veto, but not before I stand before a podium and give a State of the Union address and say, this is what Congress wanted to do, this is why it was unconstitutional, and oh, by the way, I am only the President. I do not have lots and lots of power. We the people are the source of all political power in the United States. We the people control Congress, and we the people should get on the telephone and tell your congressmen to cease and desist. If you don't, they're going to pass another unconstitutional law. Uh, would you please comment on the Libertarian Party position on uh, American overwhelming support of Israel and how you think that contributes to uh, anti-Americanism that might uh, decrease security at home? Yes, America has been involved in the Middle East for over 50 years. Uh, we were there basically to help create Israel. and We keep redrawing the lines in the sand, trying to tell people how they should live their lives. Basically, people in the Middle East are getting a little bit tired of that. And that's one of the reasons that they are so unfriendly towards us. What we need to do as Americans, we want to live our lives as Americans and have other countries leave us alone, and we need to respect other countries. Are they going to organize their government the same way that we do? Probably not, but that is not our concern. We are concerned about the years and years of war and shooting and killing that happen in the Middle East. Well, I can't prevent people from fighting, but I can stop sending money and ammunition there, and when the bullets run out, they're going to be limited to throwing rocks at each other, or at least getting those munitions from somebody else. But we need to stop our foreign policy of giving money to all of these other countries. Yeah. Um, what do you see as the general role in nuclear non-proliferation? What do I see the government's role, federal government's role in nuclear proliferation? I need. What's that? Non-proliferation. Non-proliferation. Uh, well, if you want someone to be a good neighbor, you need to demonstrate by example. The United States does have the authority to protect itself, and there is a fine. I mean, I have guns, but even I admit there is a a number of bullets that just becomes excessive. I mean, there's only so many that you can shoot at one time. As a nation, you know, we need to be able to protect ourselves, but to continue to, you know, to generate all these nuclear weapons is, is really unnecessary. Our foreign policy seems to presume that if we are nervous about someone because they are potentially developing nuclear weapons, that we can go in and kick butt just so that 
Americans can sleep better at night. Well, there are lots of countries around the world who already have nuclear weapons. Are we supposed to go and kick butt on all these other countries just because they have nuclear weapons because Americans want to sleep better at night? The best way to have security is to allow other countries to have their security. And I think that our foreign policy has been one of being the big bully on the block. We have no authorization to be the policemen of the world. We need to bring our troops home. We fought the, the World War II well over 50 years ago. I think it's time that we had an exit strategy for Germany and Japan. <laughs> What worries me is that what he's talking about mostly is uh, lack of social responsibility. I don't mean just domestically, like education, we would travel behind, but in uh, foreign policy as well, in the sense that so much of America is influenced by our own money being held by foreigners. Uh, Citibank, the biggest chill, the Citibank is a soda. Is who? The Saudi? Okay. Uh, if you take a look at the gold standard, if you take a look at the things that you're talking about, take a look at the tax structures and the Bahamas and, and the Grand Kings and whatever, uh, getting rid of the IRS, uh, I'm at a loss to understand how America won't be dissipated quickly by such a policy, by foreign intruders, by lack of concern for our own people here. How, how would you answer that? Well, you can't instill a sense of responsibility by having the federal government do things for you. My, when I was growing up, there were moments when I thought that my parents were being mean to me, but I loved them dearly because they trained me to be self-sufficient. When I was about eight years old and said, Mom, I'm hungry, she'd point to the kitchen and say, well, make yourself a sandwich. And you have to teach responsibility. And Parents have the difficult problem of allowing their children to assume responsibility that the parents don't think they're ready for. Well, unless you allow people to assume that responsibility, they'll never be ready for it. You are responsible for putting food in your mouth. You are responsible for putting shelter over your head. And you are responsible for providing for your own retirement. Well, your parents and your grandparents made the mistake of giving that responsibility to the government. When FDR said, you just give us our money because you're too stupid to invest your own money, and we'll put it in this social security system, and when you get ready to retire, you'll have more money than you know what to do with. And now the social security system is $7 trillion underfunded. Social security is very much like the Titanic with the propellers up in the air. You don't have to be a Navy Admiral to know this boat is going to sink. So we need to require people to be more responsible. If I'm not feeding you and you start getting hungry, suddenly the responsibility of finding your own food suddenly makes itself you know, pretty much evident. When nobody is taking care of your retirement, you're eventually going to realize that, gosh, I better start saving for this. And we, res we have a platform that is based on individual, uh, individual rights and personal responsibility. Yes, I agree. Americans are lazy. Look at the television programs we watch. Jerry Springer? I mean, I'm all in favor of the First Amendment, and Jerry Springer can broadcast anything he wants. What concerns me is that people watch it. <laughs> So we need to start engendering an environment where people start to take more responsibility for themselves. And one way to do that is to start removing the government protections. I just want some answers So the truth will